we're going to start at the top and just work our way all the way through. Okay? Keep in mind that, did I tell you you were nothing more than a tube within a tube? Have I told you that? And do you understand how that works? And what's inside your body and what isn't? So when you eat something, it's not inside your body yet. Just, yeah, just getting ready, right? Okay. Um, embryonically, the alimentary canal, which is the GI tract or the digestive tube, if you want, is being suspended in an outer tube, your body, okay, with a membrane. And if you do a cross section through here, this is what it looks like. So you have what's lining your abdominal pelvic cavity? What tissue? No, that's holding the intestines here. But what's lining the wall of your abdominal pelvic cavity? And this goes back to your very first lab in AP1. Anybody? Pardon me? Endothelium. It's endothelium. It's the type of tissue, absolutely. Now, specifically, what are we going to call the endothelial tissue that's lining the wall of the cavity? Parietal peritoneum. Okay? Remember that? And if it's on the organs within that cavity? But it's the same stuff, right? It's serosa because it's a closed cavity. So here's a membrane lining the outer tube. Everybody see that? So if you were to label it right here, it'd be parietal peritoneum. Now, of course, this is embryonic, okay? And we're going to get differentiation and growth occurring later on. But this same tissue, the same epithelial tissue, is coming around, coming off the wall, and attaching to the alimentary canal, or the digestive tube or tract. And so here you can see it wrapping around that. That's how it's suspending it in the center of the outer tube. Notice that in this portion and over here, it's double walled. Okay, it's coming off of here, comes, wraps around. So what would this be? What would you call that? Visceral peritoneum, right? It's on an organ. It's covering it. This is parietal peritoneum. And this is visceral peritoneum. Okay, just to give you perspective. This double wall portion is going to make up like the greater omentum or the lesser omentum. Right? Now, <clears throat> there's a law called Wolf's Law, which states what? No. Something dictates structure. Function dictate. You remember that? Function dictates structure. Okay, so what's the function of this inner tube? Its function is to break down and absorb nutrients. That's its job. And so it needs lots of surface area to absorb all the nutrients that is required. Okay? And this distance, this is where we have the mouth, and this is the anus. Okay, this distance here is not enough to do all the absorption that's needed. So it's going to start to elongate. And because this tube is limiting, it's going to have to double over and twist, etc. And that's exactly what the digestive tract does. The stomach, esophagus coming down from the mouth, the stomach forms a J-shape. It's not just an expanded tube. It forms this J-shape. And then we have the small intestine, all twisted, etc., in there. And then we have the colon, or the large intestine, doing the same thing. So what we're doing is to increase the surface area by making it longer. 
So there's more residence time, there's more surface area for absorption to take place. Okay. As this elongates, it twists and turns and doubles over, and these membranes become, as you mentioned in the small intestine, what do we call them? Mesenteries. And you saw how it sort of tries to keep things in relative place, all right? but it's also filled with blood vessel and lymphatics because that's where all the absorption is going to process in the small intestine and then be carried to the liver through a hepatic portal system to be processed. So the twisting and turning is going to occur and this structure is going to change because of its function. Its function requires it to increase surface area and so it's therefore it's dictating what the structure is going to change to, what it's going to become to. Okay, as Joshua mentioned, <coughs> digestion starts in the mouth and everybody talks about an enzyme. A lot of people already know about salivary amylase. But there's another process that starts the digestive process, which is actually more important. No. That's involved, okay? I, I was referring to chemical. Remember, in the mouth you have mechanical and chemical uh, breakdown. Mechanical breakdown is just the act of chewing, making large pieces smaller, thereby increasing surface area upon which chemical reactions can occur, chemical breakdown. So we have saliva, which is made up of principally of what? Exactly, water, principally water. Does that help you with another chemical process? A breaking down? Breaking down molecules by adding water. What is that called? Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis. Remember that word. Hydro meaning water. Lysis means to slice and dice, to break, and that's what we're doing. We're adding water and we are cleaving or breaking down the large carbohydrate molecules along with salivary amylase. Okay. So once we get the material in the mouth of a, of a certain consistency and size that it can be swallowed, then it goes down the esophagus. Okay. What's the role of the esophagus in digestion? Pardon me? Yeah, just conducting. It's a conducting tube from mouth to stomach. There's no absorption. There's no secretion of anything involved in the process of digestion that we know of. So it's just conducting uh, what was processed in the mouth to the stomach. Now we're in the stomach. The stomach is a very special region of the digestive tract in that it is a extremely harsh environment. Okay, There are certain things that you need to know associated with the stomach, some terms. One is pepsinogen. Who knows what that is? And where does it come from? Anybody? It will eventually break down proteins, exactly. Okay? Pepsinogen becomes pepsin. Pepsin is a strong proteolytic enzyme. It breaks down proteins. Okay? Now, if we look at the wall of the stomach, you're going to see pits periodically. And these pits are lined with a variety of cells, one of which is going to secrete proteolytic enzyme. Now, were it to secrete pepsin, it starts to digest the proteins within the pits and the wall. Okay. So the cells that are going to produce and release anything associated with this are going to release it in the form of pepsinogen. 
which is inactive. Okay? And then once it's into the lumen of the stomach, once it's cleared the wall and in the lumen of the stomach, then we're going to convert it to a strong proteolytic enzyme. And how do we do that? What is required to convert pepsinogen into pepsin? Mary. Hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. What does hydrochloric acid do to the environment of the stomach as far as pH goes? It's going to lower the pH drastically. It's going to lower it when it's when we're processing food in the stomach, what is the range? 1.5 to 2.0. That is almost off the scale. Okay? So the acid being produced here is as strong or stronger than, say, your battery acid. <clears throat> it's that low pH that then converts pepsinogen into pepsin. Okay? Another advantage of having such a low pH here is that it is a, uh, a barrier to pathogens that are being introduced into the system. Okay? So this is a good first line of defense um, before things continue on into the rest of, of the system. We're going to hold the contents back with a valve or a sphincter, which is a circular muscular valve of smooth muscle, until we have the contents pretty well liquefied, and we're going to call it chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. And when this chyme is ready to process, then it's going to move from here into the small intestine. Now, you need to know the regions of the stomach. And if we look at pretty much this region where the esophagus is coming in, does anybody remember what that's called? Cardiac. Okay, so I'll just make little heart symbol there because that's where its location and derives its name. And then we have this hump or sort of the roof of the stomach and what's that called? The fundus. Where have you heard that before? Top of what? It's our second lab. The top of the cervix? <laughs> that's real close. The cervix is down here and the fundus is up here. So what is, yeah exactly, okay? So the roof, <laughs> Callie, what's funny, <laughs> okay, is uh, also called the fundus. The, the major portion is called the, no, over here, this stuff, the body, right? Like many structures, like the sternum has a body, okay. The, Epididymis has a body, okay. And then this end here terminates in the pylorus. The pylorus is a, actually functions as a muscular pump, okay? So when we have the contents coming down here in the consistency and sufficient molecular breakdown going that it's ready to continue on the processing in the next region, which is the duodenum. Which is about how long? Ten inches. Ten inches. Okay. So we're going to hold back with this little valve here, or sphincter, called the pyloric sphincter. How do we keep this contents? Remember, the stomach is kneading and sort of uh, massaging it, the contents so that we're exposing the contents surface area to, to the enzyme to break down the proteins. How do we keep it from backing up there? <coughs> By what? Remember, it's gastroesophageal. Okay, I mean, you would think it would be esophagogastric, but it's going to be backwards. And believe me, we had answers that form <laughs> in previous labs, okay? So it's gastroesophageal, gastro, of course, referring to the stomach. 
because of this harsh environment, we have certain protections to not damage this, the wall of the stomach. One is that the cells, the epithelial cells, have a high rate of uh, replacement. My, mitotic division is going on. So we're always replacing these cells that have been exposed to this harsh environment. In addition to that, the stomach in its walls here in the pits has two types of mucus glands. Once it secrete a very watery mucus like saliva and its function of course is hydrolysis, right? The other is very viscous thick alkaline mucus and that forms a coating to protect against the acid environment so it's not damaging the wall. We don't have that protection before the stomach nor do we have it after the stomach. So it's very critical that the contents here not back up into the esophagus, okay? You've heard of GERD or uh, heartburn, acid reflux, etc. And that's when this valve this, uh, is either leaking or is open to the point where we're getting backflow into the esophagus, which needs to be addressed pretty quickly because we're going to get erosions and lesions occurring in the esophagus, we can very quickly lead to esophageal cancer. By the same token, if we have the contents here leaving and going into the duodenum, its inner walls don't have the protection that the stomach does, and so we can start causing irritation, lesions, etc. Duodenal ulcers can occur here, um, and eventually cancer, polyps, and then cancer, okay? So I would say that the key function, the responsibility of the duodenum is what? Is what? Neutralizing. To neutralize the acid coming in. So if this pump is going to start squirting contents into the next region, the duodenum, the first order of business since there's no protection on the walls of the duodenum and the rest of the intestine is to neutralize it. So if we look at what's going into the duodenum, which is what this is, okay, we have the pancreas The liver, okay, and what's the liver producing? In this case, okay, one of at least 200 functions of the liver is to be constantly producing bile. So bile is being produced, we're going to look at two major lobes of the liver, although there are four. We have a right and a left lobe, and therefore the ducts coming out of that are going to be referred to as the right and left or left and right hepatic ducts. So at this point, we're going to call this, these tubes or ducts hepatic, referring to the liver. Where they unite, then the term becomes common hepatic duct, which you've seen that used with the common uh, pulmonary artery going to the lungs and then it branches off into left or right. So we're going to use the same format here, common uh, hepatic duct, and then it will change and become the common bile duct, or you'll see it referred to as just simply the bile duct. But the bile duct is what is going to be entering into, in conjunction with the tube from the pancreas. So this is called the hepatopancreatic, hepato referring to the ducts coming from liver and the pancreas, and an ampulla is a little swelling that's formed because we're bringing two tubes together to form one, okay? So there's a little swelling here, and that's what the hepatopancreatic ampulla is. All of these terms are in your handout as well. If this valve sphincter, okay, it's frequently called the sphincter of odi, or the hepatopancreatic sphincter, they're the same thing, is a little valve that's here. 
And I think I've shown all of the in green, so I'll put that here. When there is no fat here to be processed, uh, we don't need the bile. This may be closed, and therefore the bile, which is almost constantly being produced, is going to back up and then go into this tube into a little storage container called the gallbladder. Interestingly enough, another name for bile is gall. So you could call this the bile bladder if you want, but the normally it's referred to as the gallbladder. Gall is referring to, is the same term. It's another term referring to the same substance, bile. That duct is called the cystic duct. So everything after the cystic duct joins the common hepatic duct, now we call it common bile or bile duct. Okay, so the name changes at that intersection. Bile, its principal function is to do what? Emulsify fats. Okay, it's essentially a detergent and it functions to break down not an enzymatic reaction, okay, but physically breaks globs into droplets, increasing the, si the surface area upon which other enzymes, which we'll mention, can start working on them. Fat is very hard to digest relative to the other nutrients. Roughly, it takes about three hours to digest carbohydrates. Six for proteins, nine for fats. Okay. And not only is it hard to digest fats to break it down and requiring something like bile, but it can't be absorbed the same way that carbohydrates and proteins are, and we'll get to that in a minute. Also coming into the duodenum is what we call pancreatic juices, and pancreatic juices are made up of neutralizing buffers to do the same thing that bile can do. Bile is <clears throat> the acid, bile acids and bile salts are floating into a solution, a watery solution, that has NaCl in it, okay, it's uh, salty, and also functions as a neutralizer. So it's helping to reduce the acidity coming in from the stomach. Pancreatic juice does the same thing. It also contributes to neutralizing uh, the very low pH liquid coming in from the stomach. In addition, it has all the other enzymes needed to finish up digesting carbohydrates, fats, and lipids. So there's pancreatic amylase. But instead of using pepsinogen, does anybody know what's used in the small intestine, in the duodenum? Trypsinogen is the inactive form which will then become trypsin. Similar to what we're doing here, pepsinogen to pepsin, but over here coming from the pancreas, we have trypsinogen becoming trypsin. Of course, we can't use a low pH to cause this conversion as we did here, so we aren't using pepsinogen. We're not using pepsin as the enzyme. We're using a different one which can be converted by a hormone, okay? 